Hello and welcome to the Rock on Tours podcast. I am Gary Kemp. And I am Guy Pratt. This week on the show, we're taking a bit of a break from the music, although not really, to chat to a king of comedy, a man whose TV shows and characters are familiar to millions, watched by record-breaking audiences and consistently voted the greatest TV shows of all time. You'd be hard-pushed to find a more creative writing partnership in TV, film and theatre. Please welcome the Lennon or McCartney, I'm going with Lennon, of TV. It's Ian Lafrenet. Hey. So Ian Lafrenet has written The Likely Lads, wrote Alveda Zane Pet, wrote Porridge, which which was a staple diet of mine on TV uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Was it the 80s or the 70s, Ian? It was the 70s. God, was it? A great okay. decade for me. And of course, and Alveda Zane Pet was the Alveda 80s. Alveda was the 80s, Love Joy was the 90s, and all other things since then unbelievable I, I mean really you didn't just I mean, write shows you no, created I know the trouble, culture the trouble with talking about all these things it's like people who make great hit albums and their 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 signature landmark yeah. thing but people forget they've actually done something since <laughs> uh, but I'm very happy to talk about whatever you want. I know. And it, but it's, uh, no one says Alvida Zane Pet properly, do they? It's like Alvida Zane Pet. Alvida Zane Pet. I still can't spell it. <laughs> and I'm not, every time I write something about uh, uh, Dick always says, you spelled it wrong again. I so, still always remember, it was one of the most evocative billboards ever, uh, um, which is extraordinary. It's actually very Brexit. It was because uh, I remember there was one on Waterloo Road and it was the two cement mixers. And one had an RAF disc on it and one had the Luftwaffe thing. And it was, and the, it just said, "British brickies take on the Germans." Actually, they had a lot of great <laughs> advertising. Yeah, but yeah, I've got a lot of things. I've got. Uh, the, wait, wait, sorry, I'm. Was Alvin the same pet? I was just. I have to explain to the viewer that I've just got off a ten and a half hour flight from India, <laughs> but I, I am obviously galvanised to be in the presence of rock royalty. <laughs> <laughs> but was Alvin the same pet only only possible because of free movement of of people? <laughs> And it, therefore, now it can't no, be possible. No, it, it was before free movement came. Free movement came in, and okay, we, we need to be. We don't want to turn to the Romaniacs podcast, <laughs> uh, which is a very good podcast. Uh, no, it was. It was before free movement, wasn't it? Well, free movement it was, was nineteen eighty-two, eighty-three. Then the second series was. Anyway, how did Jimmy Nail get a job in Germany? That's what I want to know. <laughs> how did they all get to go? And whose idea was that? That a no, bunch of Frank, the director Frank, Frank Rodham, Rodham yeah. you know, who'd done quite a other and he went, he went to Hollywood, and he made a film called Lords of Discipline. Suddenly, Frank was hot. Called what? What's Lords it? of Discipline. Oh, oh yeah. right. And yeah, Frank was hot, and he had a house in the Hollywood Hills, and his neighbour was Dad Hannah. And he was able to watch her swimming laps naked every morning. So life was good for Frank, consider, considering he was from Stockton on Tees. <laughs> they don't swim naked in Stockton on Tees. No, no. And Frank, well, do. Frank had gone home, you know, like me, he's got great roots in the Northeast, great affection, great ties. And he'd met an old mate of his he was at school with called Mick. And he said, what are you doing, Mick? And he said, oh, I have to work in Germany because there's no work here. And, and Frank was intrigued. And, and Frank, I think, popped over with Mick. And, and so Frank said to Dick Knight, I've got this idea. It's so you. And when, he told us over a lunch in West Hollywood at a place, do you remember a guy called Moustache? Yes, yes, we yes. We must yes, have yes, had yes. a many a night there. <laughs> Anyhow, he told us the story about what the... So they couldn't get work here. The, the thing that appealed to Dick and I was they were living... And when he told they were living in huts... It was like they were living, they were building the Germany that their, you know, that their fathers had destroyed. <laughs> they were rebuilding it. And they were living in huts, which was just like a stalag, <laughs> like a prisoner of war with, Ger with German yeah. bosses, you know, saying Englander. So it was irresistible. And I went with Martin McKean, the producer, and Mick to Germany to see for myself. We went to Düsseldorf and... Uh, the uh, we got off at Dusseldorf Airport and Mick gave his passport and was immediately arrested. <laughs> yeah, he was arrested for unpaid fines from his previous trip as a brickie. I mean, that's a pure Oz moment, <laughs> <laughs> absolute pure Oz. And so Martin and I had to use all our per diem uh, to bail him out, and it was just it was great. So then we pitched it to Central Television, who, and 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 Margaret Matheson, a woman, was head of drama. And she, she commissioned it. It was the timing was so good because, you know, it, there was the backlash against Thatcherism right. by the working class. 
We never imagined it would be a hit. Music seems to thread its way through your life. And, and of course, Frank Rodham did Quadrophenia, didn't he? Yeah. Was that Frank was... did Quadrophenia, yeah. In a way, Alvina's own pet in the 80s was the antidote to Brideshead Revisited, wasn't it? Which is how the 80s started on television. Yeah, I mean, very true. And then suddenly culture wanted to take more interest in, in the working classes. Boys in the Black stuff and all that. Well, yeah, Boys in the Black stuff came out. It was a coincidence. Oh, right. You know, neither of us ripped the other one off. It was just, and, and I loved it. It was a great series too. Yeah, that was fantastic. It was more dramatic than ours, perhaps. Uh, more emotional. But, but the two of them... It was funny. We went to a, a football match at Liverpool... And, and the uh, what was they? They were singing this song because it was Liverpool Newcastle. It was something like, and oh, it yes. was like E I Adi O Oz is better than Oz. That was E I Adi O Oz is better than Oz. It was. It became a football chant, which is a great accolade if you're right. If you well, yeah, a, well, we have inspired. the so well, yeah, they say they um, uh, they play fearless, don't they? At Liverpool matches because of. Um, because it has the cock crowd at the end of it, the Pink Floyd song that we do. Yeah, in our yeah, yeah. But what the thing that is extraordinary about, I, that always gets me with um, Alfred saying, is the fact that it was written in Beverly Hills. Here's a funny story, but although people have heard it, Mick, the bricklayer, who inspired everything, Mick became our technical advisor. So sitting in Beverly Hills, one would sometimes need to know what what is the spirit level? <laughs> <laughs> what is damp course? You know? Can you go out and get the bubble yeah, at the yeah. spirit level? So it was a Mick didn't have a telephone, so it was a, arranged that every Friday night we would ring him at a at a phone box in Stockton at, at, at a certain time uh, because of the eight hour time difference. We would ring him at breakfast, and he would be after he left the pub. <laughs> <laughs> and he was standing there. Obviously, Mick, um, I don't want to insult him, but I think he had a bit of previous. So when a police car pulled up, he was waiting for the phone and said, what are you doing, Mick? Assuming he was loitering with intent. <laughs> and he said, I'm waiting for a phone call from the producers in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> At which point the police said, all right, right. You know, and, you know, thought he was taking the piss. And they got out and the phone rang. The phone rang. <laughs> Oh, really? And then he mixed it. He, he, I don't know if it was Dick or I. We explained to the police that what he'd said was absolutely true. <laughs> that is amazing. That Do you is think amazing. there's is there more comedy value out of working class people, or is it because of your background that you can relate? No, no, to it's that? not working class. All all our work has been about people struggling against the. It, it's about captive situations. The likely lads in the original were trapped by their environment. Porridge was the ultimate trap. Yeah. Our feeders then they were trapped by um, the commitments, the movie. Working class kids trapped by their environment. Forces never thought, of opposition. Never yeah. thought they'd get away with it. They're, all of them are kind of a bad asset. So, you know, the, our ultimate script was written by Hancock. Two people in a, stuck in a uh, lift. Oh, the lift? Yeah. You know uh, what I mean? I'm so, not a man of my age. I'm more that, a man of his age. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so that that's just the way it was. Now, in mm. recent years, with drama and pitch up, but a lot of the music films have written are the same thing. They're about aspiration or relevance. Right. You know, the, the Still Crazy, for example. I was going to say, that brings us very tightly film, to Still Crazy. Uh, 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 you know, you, uh, the musicians, veteran musicians, are always getting asked, why are you still doing that? Like Dick and I, why should... And I think the answer is relevance. You just don't want to be feel that you have nothing to offer. Yeah. You know, so the, the, the word retirement is anathema. So I met you and Guy with, with, with um, when Guy and I did some work on on Still Crazy. I ended up doing the, the yeah, yeah. musical supervision, which was a bit of a misnomer. I basically had to. You also showed people how to move. Well, that's what stage. I did. I had. You to, did, you I, 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 to build I had. This is a movie you did in whenever it was the early nineties. Two thousand, I think. Two thousand. No, really, no, it was. It was two thousand ninety nine. I think. Well, it was. It no, came out in two thousand. Yeah, and. Um, and it's about a band that get back together again. And Bill Nye was the lead singer, and Jimmy Nails in it, and there's uh, Stephen Ray and um, Billy Connolly and Tim Spall, and 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 so I was given these guys in a rehearsal room for nearly two weeks to turn them into a band, watching videos and 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 it was a it was a great film to be part of, and you had a real coup in it as well because you you got Bruce. Um, Chris Robinson, Robinson yeah. to to play the band member who didn't really want to come back, and then he did, uh, the Maverick. Um, it was a great, your love of music and and, and and no, I know we didn't show any music, from, but I'll tell you something you might have forgotten. It was the first time I met you, and you were given the circumstances that you were at the time with Spada Valley. I remember saying to you, you know, given that this film is about a band 
trying to heal old wounds by reforming. <laughs> I said, <laughs> does, is the possibility it might happen to you? And you were so <laughs> indignant. You said, not a fucking <laughs> chance yeah, in the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. Those Bastards are, <laughs> are suing me as we speak. Well, and I went, oh, sorry, oh, okay, okay, um, thanks for well, that, Gary. In, in, and then a year later, two years later, Dick and I are on a boat. And we're in Sydney, no, Adelaide. We go, and, and we're walking around Adelaide, and there's a mu- and there's a great there's posters everywhere, <laughs> Spandau Valley. Yeah. And I thought, oh well, yeah. old, wound, old wounds did heal. The, uh, the, the trouble is, I wish you'd written the proper script because I think we'd have a better denouement because it, it's all gone crazy again. <laughs> there's, a great, there's a great line. There's interesting. There's a great line in that that Bill has um, when he says, "The trouble with us is with with people like us is we peak so early." Which is quite oh, a good. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing, isn't it? Yeah, which yeah. is uh, which, which is very true. You know, which you're right. It's very much the thing for. It's what I say to my wife on a daily basis. <laughs> 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 also, another thing, the Brian, the Bruce, the Bruce Robinson character. Now he has. Who, the, the, there's definitely an element of Sid Barrett to him, isn't there? In, yes. Yeah, because he's damaged. In fact, well, the, in film, people assume he's dead. Yeah. That he died, and then you oh, find yes, out he wasn't. Right. That he's actually in a kind of. He's like a Buddhist in a kind of working in a garden in some some place. He's dropped down out. in Somerset and 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 reinterest and reinvented his life. There is that is uh, and and that is very Sid Barrettish. Well, because also there's a because someone asked me about this. Not that I have a new Sid Barrett or anything. Yeah. But there's a because there's a, th- a line that Bruce has where he talks about how he carries all his songs around in a Sainsbury's carrier bag. Yes. And some of them, and I don't know if it was Sid, because there isn't, isn't there some story of some legend, lost legend, turning up in a pub with a load of songs in a, in a Sainsbury's carrier bag? Not Maybe not Sainsbury's. Really? I was, there, yeah, there, I don't know if that was just coincidence. Or... I think another reference, you know, for some of the characters was Peter Green. Oh, okay. Because, you know, he, yeah, was, yeah. Uh, he was obviously quite odd. Yeah. Someone said... Well, there's a few from that band. I don't know if it was your pal Nick Mason told me. Someone told me the story that when they realised he was going a bit odd, was that he he was in the studio one day and someone noticed that he had a a piece of cheese in his hair. This is Peter Green. Yeah. So apparently (laughs) they, they kind of let that go. (laughs) <laughs> but, but the next day the piece of cheese was still there and that's when you thought something's just... I don't know if that's apocryphal oh, or maybe what, he used to carry his rider around with him <laughs> let's go back to, to the beginning you know where you grew up and wh- how you came to be a writer uh, didn't you start writing songs initially no I, 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 I lied about writing I said I was a songwriter because I had to have some kind of identity you know, in, to be in London in the 60s. That's you, cool. you famously said, I love, I love it. And I, I saw you talk once and, and you, you said this great line about how, um, it's obviously a wound you carry, you said how the swinging 60s was 300 people. Well, it was... And no one else was... Dave, I think, think actually yeah. David Bailey said, well, we did this documentary about the 60s recently called That's My Generation, my yes. which you must watch. And, and it, it's, it's said in there about it that, that really... It was like a party for 500 very talented, glamorous people. And certainly, it just arrived, and Dick and I were certainly not on the guest list. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I only crashed the party late in the 60s through a wonderful man called Robert Freeman, the photographer who did all the Beatles' oh, first right. albums. Yeah, yeah. And he recently died. And this is how I crashed into the 60s, if you want to hear of it. Yes, yes, absolutely. So Robert Freeman took a liking to me for some reason, and he, and, he, and he asked me to work on a script with him, which he was going to direct. He had a g- great gig. I mean, he did the artwork for the Beatles films. That He did their albums. He photo- he made commercials, and his studio was filled with beautiful models. And He was just too cool. And then one day he said, I'll pick you up on the King's Road by the what it was then called the Markham Arms. And he appeared, he drove a Studebaker Avanti. Do you know what that is? Uh, I know what Studebaker is. Well, anyhow, yeah. with the Avant model. it pulls up. It's only two seats, and there's a blonde in this passenger seat, so I have to squirm under her, and it was Anita Pallenberg. And that is the moment <laughs> uh, that Ian Lafreny gate crashed the, crash the yeah. party. Yes, yes. <laughs> and was Dick part of that? When did you meet Dick? No, he, he got married. He wasn't in the 60s. So how he did you in, meet? He was in Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't in the 60s, I, he was in no, no, he's he came, forever living it down. <laughs> no, he came to work and I told him all about it. 
<laughs> Kevin, I'm trying to dig this out of you, yeah. Ian. How did you first become a writer with... <laughs> well, and, all right. When I went to London, it was, it, you know... The, the first few years of this, the 63, 62, 63, it wasn't the 60s London. It was still, everything was still 50s. Austerity. 50s clothes, duffel coats, yeah. corduroy, jazz clubs. This is my street, Cof- sort of coffee bars. kitchen sink yeah. drama it was, London. Oh, it was real 50s till suddenly everything changed. Yeah. Suddenly all this incredible same time with the first yeah, 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 and then all the things that, this collision of art and design and, it was this basically revolt against the boredom of the 50s yeah. uh, by a generation, you know, who were sick of their parents talking about the war. And there's various psychological reasons, but smarter people than me. Or not explained. talking about the war. Isn't it? I remember Pete Townsend talking about this, how no, that was a, no one could get anything out of their parents who'd been through this terrible thing. That was one of the reasons that it was just like, for God's sake, we want to... Anyway, sorry, I'm digressing. Well, no, no, but actually... Here, name dropping. Ringo said to me, "Hang, yeah, yeah, all right. It's why we're here. Drop names. It's it's why we're here, Ringo. If I'm going to (laughs) drop, he said to me when he found out that I'd done national service, and he just missed it. He said that was the major reason, in his opinion, that all that music scene happened. That these guys were living in dread they were going to go in national service, and they didn't." And they suddenly, oh, that's, and, yeah, and they, that's, they'd gone to yeah. work in factories so they could avoid it, and then suddenly it wasn't and on. It's funny then, and right. they did what, so they did what they wanted to do. But then they went on and invented their own uniform. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So come on. So I met Dick in a pub in Notting Hill, and he was he was at the BBC. He had a job at the BBC. He was a studio manager like this. He would arrange the mics. <laughs> if he was here all those years ago, that would say Clement. <laughs> my my headset's not working. <laughs> so, so, but and the BBC had a, like an amateur group, and uh, anyhow, he, he, I was a bit envious that he was in theatrical and you know, even amateur group, and I tentatively submitted something, and then he and I wrote us something together. In the end, we wrote a lot of the but stuff. You had, but that, so it was a this review. Is the thing. What, right. what were you planning to do with your That's the thing. So you were clear you were already writing things. No, I wasn't was writing the, shit. Okay. Well, you'd written, you'd I'd written, no, I'd submit. written nothing. Right. Let us home. And then Dick and I both loved, you know, we weren't watching television. It was the 60s movies. It was this emancipation of working class energy that manifested yeah, itself, yeah. not just in music and art and fashion, but film. These yeah. great films, Courtney, Finney. Yes, all, yes, you yes, know, yes, Michael Caine yes. was saying that, you know, it... Uh, Party, it's a, it's an it's 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 in our document. It's in our documentary. Not so you know, actors had compulsory elocution lessons at drama mm-hmm. school, and I remember an actress telling me that one day he went up for a job with Lindsay Anderson, the director, and he read it. And Lindsay said, "Very good. Now read it in the voice you used to have in the schoolyard." And he said it was the most liberating moment of his mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly, all heroes in British films of the fifties were up were upper class. Yeah. And working class people were, boi- you know, stoked, stoked boilers and <laughs> greased aeroplane parts. So, so <laughs> Pinter would have been an influence. Yeah, as and well. suddenly yeah. there was this there was this whole new working class here, literally working class heroes. So it was now it was not Kenneth Moore and Stuart Granger. It was Bates, Courtney, Finney, yeah, Harris, Harris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was so Dick and I loved this. So when we wrote this sketch, it was like a homage to working class heroes then dick gets offered a director's course at the bbc at the end of which he has to do a practical exam and he said to me we should expand that sketch and i'll shoot it as a 20 minute play so what was the original sketch well it was about two guys called Mm -hmm. bob and terry can you believe it discussing a date that had with two girls and the cross cutting between so we did this as dick's exam and then Dick passed his exam, and someone said, uh, do you two see this as a series? Can you believe it? Wow. And, and that was the likely that. Wow. So, so that's the, can you imagine the luck? Imagine the luck of that. Because what was beautiful about the Likely Lads was that there was there was such a sort of there was a maudlin quality to it. It was there was serious. Yeah, it, it was, was melancholy and melancholy. sad and, and and 
that so they so the public snatched on and thought this was this is the this is a working class comic and it's, it's the, not a drawing room in Surrey. No. Also, can I just point and write something that just the other night it happened to be and um, just show how culturally powerful that show was. Uh, I was at a thing, town, and uh, or I'll never. And uh, I was talking to Angus Dayton, and he was saying uh, he was with his son, and he was saying we've got to go home, but I have to be very careful because we we um, we want to watch this match that was just on. But you know, so I don't want to know the result. Don't tell me about it. And I went, "Oh, you're doing a likely lads." He went, "Yes, absolutely." Yeah. And that's like still, that's what forty five years later, fifty years later. Forty five. That's yeah. an absolute thing. You know, you say you're doing a likely lads, and and people know exactly what you're talking about. But it's still true <laughs> because I live in America. And there's eight hour time difference. If I'm watching a recorded game at nine in the morning and the phone rings, I pick up the phone and say, I don't want to know the score. <laughs> because you've already yeah. seen it. Was, was your in, in, I, I see a bit of an influence from, from Steptoe and Son in that one of them is, is hugely aspirational and wants more and doesn't want just what the working class culture has oh, given Oh, that's him. a good question. And the, and the other the other guy yeah, was, has a big chip on his shoulder about this it. This is true. This is true. When I said we were influenced, you know, by the movies and we didn't watch the, the two things. I mean, you don't go to London to grow up in the 60s and watch television at night. Yeah, yeah. But I must admit, the big exception, I mean, was was uh, Steptoe and God, it was Golden and Simpson. It was Golden and Simpson. They were our mentors. But they they, were, I mean, because they, were they, our they were dealing with sort of existential yeah, issues they were long our heroes. before anyone I mean, else, weren't they? It was Hancock and Golden and Simpson. And yes, you're right about... He, yeah. he was very aspirational, um, Steptoe Jr. He, he saw himself as a 60s person. And, you know, and, but and wasn't it, part you, of that that Harry H. Corbett was like that, and they, they were actually being very mean by writing the character. They were actually trying to poke really. Harry H. Corbett because he he saw himself as a great Shakespeare. Well, that's an interesting. That's an interesting thought. Well, yeah, yeah, there was a very was a funny thing, actor, yeah. you know. That do you remember there was another Harry Corbett who had a sooty, who had a sooty. glove puppet <laughs> yeah. called Sooty. Yeah. Well, apparently it's in our book, in our memoir. Yes, apparently right. Harry Corbett was offered an, an MBE or an OBE, but they sent the invitation to the wrong person. <laughs> they went to the wrong Harry Corbett. I, and we always wondered, did he take Sooty to the palace? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and you thank you, your majesty. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the guy talking about that, you know, how, how the writing was based around the real life of the characters. Did your writing develop once you'd cast uh, those two guys to play your likely Well, Dick ads? cast those two guys to cast Rodney and Bob. Because Dick, Dick not only... Did we write the series having written nothing before? He was told he could direct it because someone took yeah, ill. Yeah. So it was quite astonishing. Oh, I mean, the ultimate, sorry to skip, but the ultimate, because the ultimate piece of casting ever is the idea of writing Fletcher without knowing it was going to be Ronnie Barker. Oh, no, that didn't. Do you know what I mean? Because I mean, that is the ultimate character. I mean, no, 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 we, we, no, no. Uh, we did know it was going to be Ronnie. You did, okay. What happened is in those days, remember there used to be a series called Com comedy players but no the yeah. BBC commissioned a series called Seven of One and for Ronnie Barker a showcase for Ronnie and and uh, he would play a different character in each and of course they were thinking ooh we might get a, a spin off you know we might get a series out of at least one or two of them so we wrote two one was called Prisoner and Escort about Ronnie being taken to prison by two guards and the other one was Welsh about a Welsh mining family and I think one of the others was open all hours. So the yeah. So they said to us, wow. We want a series from you guys and Ronnie. And is it gonna be the Welsh one or is it gonna be the guy going to prison? And we met Ronnie. Actually we first met Ronnie before we start writing in the Acton BBC Cant canteen. At the next table were Pan's people. Do you remember them? Of course. Of course. Five. <laughs> Our childhood was shaped yeah. by them. Our sexuality is shaped by them now. Yeah. Who just take <laughs> perspiring in their leotards for Maria. <laughs> there is even... Uh, even no, all, that's all, all of us were distracted. But anyhow, in the end, we That said, line's going to be used backstage when we're on tour. <laughs> perspiring in your leotard, love. <laughs> and and he, I remember Ronnie Barker saying, oh, there's big babs. Oh. And so <laughs> we chose the prison one. And in the pilot, it wasn't just Ronnie, it was Brian Wilde and, and uh, Fulton McCart. Fulton McCart, yeah. So then when we decided to go oh. to series, there was only one left to cast, and that was... And oh, that was wow. um, Richard Beckinsale. Richard. Yeah. Hey, Fort Mackay was a genius as well, wasn't he? I mean, well, yeah, that, again, did, how did these actors, like, you know, Ronnie Barker and, and Fort Mackay, did they bring stuff to you? Once you start to know them, 
are you writing? F- you're writing for their voice, then, aren't you? Well, of course, you learn so much from their nuances because you know. Then, when you did Lakes of Malfitison and later on Love Trait, you're right. When you're writing for an ensemble cast, that you come there are those moments when you, or even still crazy when there's about seven or eight people, where you suddenly say, you know, we haven't really given enough to that. You have to keep juggling yeah, them yeah, all. Yeah. So no one says, I didn't get much this week. You know what I mean? <laughs> but then you are influenced, of course. I mean, Ronnie's brilliance w- was just something that w- we were handed you know, on a plate. Yeah. But then you'd looked at Richard and you looked at Brian and uh, Fulton. And of course, you start shaping things for them. I was going to say, yeah, does they've the, got the act to make you? you know, they've got a unique voice, writing. and then you. Yeah. But they had a similar balance, didn't they? They had, you know, the, the young boy who was again aspirational, wanting yes, to get it exact, it's wanting always more. There's always yeah, that's yeah, yeah. And 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 you wrote some for the stuff for the two Ronnies as well, didn't you? No, no, no. We never worked with the two Ronnies. I think we did something for one of the Sunday night the Palladium shows. A, a one-off sketch. Because oh, so, you didn't really... Well, apart from no, Tra- we Tracy Ullman, you did sketches. No, we, you, we'd never you? written a sketch except for those the review in the in a pub, you know, when we first <laughs> met, till we did Tracy Takes On. And we and we were very nervous. Uh, this was an HBO series uh, in the 90s in America. Tracy Ullman, yeah. Tracy Takes On. It wasn't the Tracy Ullman show. It was the next show after that, Tracy Takes On. And now, and we were working with a writer's room, you know, oh, yeah, seven yeah, writers yeah, and yeah, Tracy. Yeah. And we thought, oh, my God, sketches. And we had such a wonderful time. Four years. Got so many Emmys. But that, uh, it's that hard show. to write because I, I know how no, it is. No, but, but, but and it, it was like it was like Dick and I had been, you know, t- kids had been homeschooled for years and we're now in the schoolyard <laughs> with a lot of other kids. All, all writing. So it didn't bother you that other writers were chipping no, in? No. Dick and I were the, like, the senior writers with Tracy. We were also supervising producers. Uh, it, it was marvellous. Because I think I know the way it works. I did the Larry Sanders show years ago in, in LA. Oh, right. And there was one writer's name on the script. And we did the read-through. And there were eight young kids in the room. And then they were all assigned different characters. And they were all just writing gags, writing gags. And the whole script changed over the next week. And yet, it still said that same guy's name on, uh, on the oh, front Oh, really? Page. No, we had we ours was fairly rigidly structured. The, the, each show had a subject. Tracy takes on sex. Tracy takes on film. Tracy take whatever it was. So we'd sit down and work out that week's subject and pitch ideas. And so you'd say, "All right, you do that one." It was it was it was right. it, it was pretty. Uh, it was very democratic and it was very structured. I did once spend a week on on Saturday Night Live. Oh, what was and, that like? And, well, I was like a, but I was like a, a fly on the wall, watching right. the process. Process. Sorry, guys. Process. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll talk about it. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. later. <laughs> and uh, and they were. It was very much that. Was, that was just seemed to be chaotic. First, it was a much bigger cast. And a bigger cast of writers, and all the all the cast wanted to write, and they would oh, pitch right. ideas, and about, and they'd all pitch ideas, and then the producers would pick them uh, by on a Wednesday or Thursday, and then so that sets could be built on Friday, and then so you had a lot of very upset people. Oh, he didn't use my piece of scene. <laughs> let's just <laughs> talk about you. You 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 run off to Hollywood, didn't you? At some stage, you left. We didn't run off to Hollywood. <laughs> but what was it like? We, Why we did got, you? Well, that we was got, for the, got a, the American we got a, we remake got, of Porridge. Yeah, we it? got our first so, paid. Yeah. <clears throat> they made the, it was to go over and do an American version of Porridge, and uh, and how did you make that your home? And how was that for you? I don't. Well, I, well because everyone seemed to be there. And that's how mm. I met so many musicians, because all for some reason there was this massive influx of British musicians moved, moved to L.A. in the mid to late 70s. Yeah, that's oh, why punk for, happened, because you I know, lot were all being so yeah, we were, we were, it, there. We were yeah. those knobs in mansions, <laughs> as, as uh, Keith Moon, who went down to a punk club in London. That's right, and, yeah, he, got, yeah. and he was, was confronted a, by Robert and Elms. And, Robert Elms yeah. and, he, and someone said, and you know, be, what is it, you, well, whatever it was, effing tosses in mansions, you know. Yeah. But anyhow, we weren't in mansions, <laughs> but I did play for this soccer team, which was all musicians, and and two or three of us, and and it became like a, a sort of very homely. All these people, and and there was the sun, and it was L.A., and you think, well, I, I like this. Let's 
you know, let's no, not course. rush going home. But the for- Porridge series we did twenty twenty four episodes, I think. It ran, yeah, yeah, and it, but it was it wasn't uh, the same. But you, because you love musicians, don't you? You seem to have yeah, a lot yeah. of friends. Well, I, obviously, who are I obviously wanted to be Jeff one, Lynn's but I'm a not. good friend of yours as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, that's no, but it's from those days that my uh, my friends uh, that I started knowing so many musicians and and became part of the you know the world of the recording studio mm-hmm. and the backstage pass. Of course. Cool. Right. Before then, I had never been to a concert with a backstage pass, and you're right. <laughs> it, 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 it was miserable. It's murder getting you to come to a gig in LA. That's always too far for you. I don't know how my wa- <laughs> I don't know how I got a second date with my wife because my first date with my wife, I took her to see Alice Cooper <laughs> at the Forum. Anyone who doesn't know the Forum, everyone, Forum is a round building, and I, without the backstage pass, had forgotten which area I had parked my car. <laughs> so, so you can imagine that. <laughs> So you're writing a musical, aren't you, yes. about the, the kinks at the moment? No, not no. a musical. Oh, it's, it's not a musical? A, a regular movie. It's about the kinks. It's, I mean, I think it, it to be, I don't want to be boastful, but I think it's elevated from a standard rock bio right. by, the, by the nature of the relationship of the two brothers. Yeah. Ray and Dave, you know, who... This is the thing I'm always saying to hit, by the way, because it is it, they are the one of the templates of there are so these great rock brother relationships, and I'm always saying to Gary how he and Martin just constantly let the side down really badly because <laughs> yes. they love each other, which is no good to anyone, frankly. Wait till you see our documentary. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> but sorry, I've, carry on here. I've carry seen on. Well, I know. I mean, but obviously, no. Martin and I have just done a comedy. Uh, ah, documentary. it's very very funny. Yeah. I have a walk on. Yes, more than that. <laughs> there was there, there's so much more psychologically strange and disturbing about and at times toxic about the relationship with Dave and Ray you know much it's m- much more than the Gallagher's yeah, yeah. Uh, but but a lot of the film I mean we only we only do we're not trying to do a lifetime and then oh my god it, it the film really after Ben's in 1971 where Ray had a kind of meltdown at the, the White City uh, it's it's interesting though cause Ray's lyrics are not dissimilar to your tone of the kind of voices that you give some of your characters that's a that's a very very good point he, oh, that's a bit profound mm-hmm. yeah but it just is sort of is, is London whimsy is melancholy it's, yes what's a, yes a southern equivalent I suppose well it's yeah. Yeah. what's interesting about them you see they they went and with the British invasion and where the world could have opened up you know they played the Hollywood Bowl headlining yeah. above the Beach Boys and uh, Sonny and Cher and the Righteous Brothers, this this was their moment. And then you're catapulted into the globe. But they never, they weren't allowed well, back. Well, they weren't allowed back, but it's quite... An, no, um, they never got back for five years. No, they, five years, but there was something they did. Visa and it was to do, no, yeah, it was, no, but, no. But here's the funny no. thing. They got I, up everyone's I, nose. Well, exactly, I was going to say, because there was a problem with, they. there was all this backhand as you do for unions and stuff like that. And they would, and, and you know, yeah, because Ray always says, well, is this terrible? Because they're expecting all this stuff. And you think, yes, but everyone else put up with it. But they didn't, you know they mean? didn't have professionals. You can't, you can't really blame America. No, because they had these, but the Beatles, they had some real tough the managers, didn't they? The Beatles and they were always, they were, they were shepherded around. They were looked after. Yeah. They were cosy. They were coming. Cool, they were managed. They, had, you know, and the kinks went without that. Managers stayed behind in England, and everything was a bit disorganized. And they kept, as you say, they kept being asked to pay dues yeah. for this, dues for that, and they kept saying bollocks. And eventually, and then I think they upset Dean Martin and the Dean Martin show or something, and they were thought of him, and they were really subversive. And badly behaved, you know them and the who the, they were. Well, yeah, you actually say in your in your book, don't you? Yeah, you they, actually, they were the kind of most they, punk and yeah, kind of and, of, and they of lost their them. great shot. So, d- in a way, what Ray and it's in Ray's wonderful book X Ray, Ray sort of out of his anger and disappointment became more didn't make any concessions to America. His songs became quintessentially English. They were very much influenced by the, the music hall that his father loved. Mm-hmm. And so you had <laughs> uh, Sunny Afternoon and you had yeah. Autumn Almanac and you had all, and Terry and Julie, of course. You had all these wonderful songs which, which were quintessentially very British mm. and didn't help the cause in those days, but of course were the test, in the test of time, are, are, are classics. Tell us a little bit about how you write, how you and Dick go through the creative process. 
Uh, well, there's nothing to tell, really. Mm. And what is it, banter? No, it's just, you, I go to work, I go to his place, or we used to go to offices, or stu- wherever it is. We've written everywhere. One and, writes and one's paces, And you just, right? you, you, you do an eight-hour day. But you put a story together first, and tennis. then build the gags and build the <laughs> scenes afterwards. No, uh, well, over the years, we used to wing it more. You used to think, oh, just start start this episode now. Our feet is in. I've got the first scene. And then, you, <laughs> then about halfway through, go, oh, God, how's this going to end? No, especially with the film, we work out the exact structure. It changes, of course, or, yeah. as you organically do, mm-hmm. but work out the structure. Find the characters first. We right. need to find the characters like Peter Sellers needed to find the voice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Find the characters, believe in them, and then break down the whole structure of, of, the, of, of the narrative. So you kind of could have been an actor in that sense. If you're a great writer, I always think you, you could improvise a part. Therefore, maybe you could. Well, Dick and I are the it. first people who would perform it. Yeah, I mean, we we perform it, and it's very funny because uh, Dick's wife is downstairs, so she's getting very used to different voices. You know, so sometimes they're Welsh, sometimes they're American, <laughs> sometimes you know what I mean. The funniest was when we did a rewrite of Bad Boys Two. Oh, no, so she's now hearing Dick and I doing Will Smith and. <laughs> oh, so you do you and do what's did, called polishing. Yeah, then we did a version. We did a version, of uh, an American version of Still Crazy. You oh, don't really? know about this. No, Bette Midler bought the rights, and wanted to do, but with two women, her and Meryl Streep were going to do a verse. So it became more like, if you like, a Fleetwood Mac than a oh, yes. oh, okay. Strange Fruit. But in that, that's not the worst idea in the world. But the, word, the, the, the reason this band were brought together, this is a, moving with the <coughs> times in the American version, they'd all broken up hating each other, never speak to you again, was that some big rap star sampled their lyrics oh, okay, and yeah. brought them back into the spotlight. So now we had rappers in the film. So now Nancy <laughs> Clement is now listening to Dick and I doing rap. <laughs> speaking speaking with the voice of the ghetto <laughs> amazing you you wrote a, a film which was actually one of part of my research when i did ronnie cray uh, and i thought it was one of the, was a great gangster part which was with villain villain w- with richard burton yeah so you, it wasn't just comedy wasn't you my were dad doing. that never a little part in that no and a villain was a, was he I think it's a, we it's loved writing villain because it was a nasty film with nasty people, and it was like you, you know, you're so com, you were so compartmentalised in those days, especially at the BBC. You know, you say we'd like to write drama. Don't be silly. You're light like entertainment. You, you can't write drama. You can't, you know, go into that move over there. And then, so when we did villain, it was r- wonderful to write something that surprised people. Yeah. And you just from then on, we've tried to the bank job. You see. Bank job is one of my favorite. Oh, I love the bank job. Done. That was that's so. I, that, I, I'd that, love to. I'd love to think that, kind of most of that is true. <laughs> uh, yeah, so would I. <laughs> <laughs> this but, series is one of those when you could keep talking. I know we could, we could keep we, going forever. We, we might have to wrap up on this. I yeah, think. we might have to do uh, to be continued. To be continued. Yeah, we'll next time I but next time I this get is off the from Mumbai. I think this is our series. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it in Mumbai, <laughs> live from the Sufi festival. Well, we've left so much unsaid, guys, but it's been fun. I hope people listening had as much fun as I did. <laughs> All right, listen, thank you, Ian. Um, and that's, that's about it for, the, pleasure, uh, guys. for this episode of Rock on Tours. 